Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, we're live in Denver, Colorado at the Bonneville stations. I'm here with John Bissett and Brad Hart, and we're going to have a great time. You stick around. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store, with outstanding service, saving, and support, online at bgs.cc. By the new Ruby console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerk. And by the Telos Alliance, shaping the future of audio, inspiring you to create the most exciting and engaging audio experiences imaginable. Visit telosalliance.com slash opt-in. Hey friends, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, way over here on the, the left side of your, your television screen. And uh, we are live in Denver, Colorado today doing This Week in Radio Tech. I'll introduce our guests here in just a minute. This is the show where we talk about everything from somebody else's microphone <laughs> to the light bulb at the top of the tower and all the stuff in between, digital, analog, uh, music, faders, uh, old technology, new technology. We have a good time uh, talking about these things and sharing stories and, and, and importantly, sharing ideas about how to do a better job of broadcast engineering. If you're new to the show, glad you're here. Uh, go back and watch some older shows, learn some things about the fundamentals of broadcasting. I Almost every week I hear from somebody in somewhere in Africa or somewhere in India, or in Australia, or in the Southeast Asia, uh, asking about, um, about hey, I'm, an, I'm new to broadcast engineering. What can I do to learn? Well, you found the right place, and we're glad you're here. And for us old-timers, we just have a good time. We talk about uh, the things we did last week, uh, what we had for breakfast, <laughs> and, and sometimes some real engineering things, too. All right. Uh, uh, I'm Kirk Harnack. I work for the folks at the Telos Alliance, and we do this podcast every week. With me is my colleague here, John Bissett, and he's been with us before, also works at Telos, and he's also the author of the Workbench column in Radio World Magazine. Hey, welcome in. Thanks so much, Kirk. And you, you, have to, you have to get on microphone there somehow. Well, uh, we're really glad to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. And um, uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit about what we were doing in this area in just a minute. Uh, also, we have with us Mr. Brad Hart. Hey, Brad, welcome in. Hey, Kirk. I'm nice glad to see you again. Thank you. It's good to see, yeah, you. Good to see I, you. I haven't seen you in Denver in a long time. <laughs> been a while. I, re I remember when I met you and I had, I think, an Omnia audio processor under my arm. You did. And I don't know, I don't remember if you looked skeptical or excited or maybe both. Well, I was probably both. And then, of course, after <laughs> I put it in, I was very excited. Oh, good. So, okay. That was good. Okay. Oh, awesome. Story. Yeah. Good thing. Awesome. Good deal. Yeah. Good deal. Well, uh, our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you uh, in part by uh, three terrific sponsors, uh, the Telos Alliance, also Broadcasters General Store, and this week uh, in cooperation with Henry Engineering, and also from Lavo. So uh, we're going to talk uh, about our first sponsor right now, the Telos Alliance and the VX Voice over IP Multi Studio uh, VoIP engine and, and VoIP gateway. It's an amazing product. And uh, uh, so this VX, describe to you briefly what it does. It is the ideal thing for broadcasters with two, three, four, or twenty studios to put callers on the air, to bring in live remotes, uh, to uh, to put act to get actualities from newsmakers, from reporters. You can use it for ordinary telephone calls and even for HD voice calls. There's a way to do that that's pretty exciting. And uh, there's a lot of, of VX phone systems out there for broadcasters, both at radio stations and at TV stations, and even at some non-traditional facilities as well. Well, here we are at the facilities of Bonneville, Bonneville International in Denver, Colorado. And at Bonneville here, uh, well, I'll just ask Brad, you've been using a, a, an older Telos phone system for a long time. What is that? The uh, old reliable uh, 2101. I'm glad you said reliable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, good. Absolutely. And that, but it's that, bulletproof. now that uses PRI technology, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you bring PRI phone lines in right. and then it, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it distributes your phone calls to the rooms that you want it to, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Now, um, I, uh, in a lot of markets, the cost of PRI, uh, is, has gone way up. Uh, I don't know if it has here or not, but uh, you sound like, uh, from talking to you earlier, you're going to, move your phones, your broadcast phones, uh, in, you know, to a newer model, yes. uh, newer technology. Yep. VX2 is, is on the, uh, is on the agenda for later this year. And, uh, we're, you know, looking forward to it. We've been extremely happy with, you know, the 2101 served us well, but it's time to move on to uh, newer technology and, uh, and get going on that. So, um, uh, I know that a number of broadcasters mm -hmm. have switched uh, well, first of all, you know, maybe their 2101 or whatever they were using was getting long in the tooth. But for a lot of broadcasters, the cost of their traditional ISDN, PRI, or BRI lines has gone way up. 
Uh, are you looking at saving some money with VoIP or about the same cost, or will you continue using your PRI lines? I think at this point, you know, Kirk, we're going to we're going to continue to use you know PRI, but we're still uh, you know uh, talking to Joe Mock mm-hmm. a little bit about you know a, a couple of options. So we thankfully here at the, at the in this facility, we've got several options we can choose from. And this is kind of cool with uh, Telus VX and Voice over IP. You, the customer, you, the broadcast engineer, you can choose. Um, the, the the level of reliability, the quality, and and the price point of bringing phone service in. You know, it used to be the only choice you had was POTS or ISDN from your phone provider, whoever that incumbent phone provider was. And now you've got uh, choices for bringing VoIP in, either through a managed VoIP service, uh, which will typically be on fiber or managed copper or coax. Uh, but you can also have an externally hosted PBX. And for example, my little radio stations in Mississippi and Arkansas and in Hawaii, we do exactly that. Uh, We use an external uh, PBX host. It happens to be here in Denver, Colorado. So actually at my, at my 14 radio stations, every time we pick up the phone, uh, put a caller on the air or make a business call, uh, our voice goes through Denver, Colorado. How about that? (laughs) And, and, and it, it's as reliable as our internet service is at our radio facilities, uh, which, which it's mostly reliable. Sure. We're a small, we're in small towns. So once in a while we have an outage, but it's getting more reliable all the time. I can attest to that. Now, what does that mean for you? Well, if you want to put a Telus VX system in, what you're going to find is, is a facility wide savings on doing it. We used to think of uh, phone systems as being studio by studio. We'd buy, you know, a phone system for this studio, and maybe next year we'd budget a phone system for another control room or production room, or maybe a new a new set of phones for the newsroom. Well, it's different now. Now, if you replace all your broadcast phones and hybrids with a VoIP based system called the Telos VX, you can get the cost per studio way down and improve the quality at the same time. And it's possible to save a lot of money by moving to a VoIP service, whether it's managed or whether it's uh, it's just comes in over your internet. I don't recommend that for everybody, but for some people it works fine. Uh, and it's, it's really the way to go to get you into the best audio quality, the lowest cost, and the most flexibility. So if you would, check out the Telos VX. Go to telosalliance.com. And look under uh, Telos, look for broadcast uh, phone systems, and you'll find the Telos VX. There's a picture of it right there. There's lots of videos about the Telos VX, um, how quickly it goes together, how it's easy to put together, and some ideas, uh, some white papers and other ideas about uh, getting a good return on investment from it. In fact, I was going to say, Kirk, yeah? that's one of the points that's really pretty neat. Yeah, I've had several customers that have converted from POTS lines to SIP lines and, uh, and the VX they paid for their VX system in a year to a year and a half and just the pot savings. So uh, if you're looking to save some money, uh, tell that to your general manager. He'll be very <laughs> pleased. Thanks a lot to the Telos Alliance. Thank you, John. Thank you, Brad, uh, for talking about the Telos VX. And by the way, there is also the VX Prime, which is a smaller system for broadcasters. They may only have two or three or four studios. If you want to kind of right-size that, you can get the Telos VX Prime. It's lower priced and appropriate for stations the size of my facility, say in Greenville, Mississippi. All right. This week in Radio Tech rolls on here. And Brad, um, so for those of you who don't know Brad Hart, Brad's the director of engineering for Bonneville uh, here in the Denver market area, mm-hmm. right? right? And Brad, you've been with the, the stations for quite a while, even through a, an ownership change or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a couple of them. Yeah. yeah. A couple changes. Yeah. Lincoln Financial and oh. uh, Jefferson and Jefferson Pilot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to date me, I'll just. So it's Bonneville now. Before that, it was Lincoln Financial. Before right. that, it was Jeff Pilot. Jeff Pilot. That's when I met you. Yeah. Back yeah. when we were both in high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, now, since the last time I saw you here in Denver, you've moved the facility, right? Mm-hmm. Correct. You moved here in uh, what? 2006. Six. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I must have met you in about 2001 or two or three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, w- uh, talk to me about you know as director of engineering you've got you've got a full time engineer working with you yeah Gary Nakashima he has been with me for she's uh, almost uh, eighteen years wow. now so oh, that's Gary's great. Gary's been here and a veteran uh, uh, engineer in this market and, and regionally so uh, worked at uh, you know Jones Satellite you know radio networks and all that ah. so Gary comes with uh, a a lot of experience. He would be here today, but he's out fixing something yeah, or checking on something. Yeah. 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 Um, Brad, I was asking you uh, mm-hmm. earlier, you know, 
it, it, it looks like you've got a, a settled facility here. You've got people that generally care for the equipment. Uh, you've got you've got reliable equipment, but you're, you're getting ready to make some changes. Um, you're not affected by any of the TV repack, so you don't have that on your plate like right. many FMs in, mm-hmm. in big cities do. What kind of keeps you busy these days uh, in, in the engineering f- uh, field? Well, I think, you know, uh, certainly just the day-to-day, you know, things of, you know, this doesn't work or that. There's probably more IT related things that, you know, are problematic today than there were uh, engineering wise. But, you know, we still uh, do what we can to, uh, you know, keep our facilities as, you know, competitive. And so we've got two big uh, moves for two class C's that are here to that we're pulling off this summer. And so we've uh, there, there's never a dull moment. Here, now, but believe me, moving a class C now that's a hundred kilowatt. Is this to give you an even better signal over the mm-hmm. population you want? Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. A site that, uh, that has come, uh, that, that, that wasn't available even 10 years ago has uh-huh. now become available. And, uh, you know, Bonneville is one of those companies that, uh, is always looking for opportunities to, you know, make sure that we've, um, uh, remain competitive and, uh, we, uh, you know, so they were very open to look at uh, new facilities. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, I landed here yesterday, Brad, and you know, that we always talk about Denver's the mile high city. And I walked out of the airport and the first thing I noticed was low humidity, clear skies, uh, and a little bit thin air. Um, sometimes, you know, w- when we're, uh, like, let's say we're at home and we're doing something like of all baking a cake, right. And once in a while, us guys bake a cake. Maybe I want to surprise the wife or something. Well, <laughs> And they have a high altitude baking instructions. Yeah. Now I understand that high altitude is a, is important consideration for some broadcast gear as well. Probably nothing in this particular room, but mm-hmm. at your transmitter site, uh, you've got uh, even thinner air than you have right here. Mm-hmm. How does that affect your operations at a transmitter site? Well, I think you know a couple of things, and we, we've we've got one site we're currently at now that the uh, uh, height above sea level is ten thousand six hundred feet. <laughs> So, uh, wow. just airflow through the transmitter, uh, things are derated, uh, 20 tons of air conditioning at sea level, uh, is, and I'm not an air conditioning expert, but I can tell you it's derated substantially. So 20 tons, even at the mile high city, and then you move it up to 10, six, uh, is might substantially be like the equivalent of 10, 10 tons. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah it might be half. Yeah. 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 So mm-hmm. there's a lot of derating there. And then of course, uh, just, uh, air, airflow through the transmitters. And, um, so those are a couple of things that, uh, that the transmitter manufacturers have been able to work out, you know, with us, but it's not as plug and play as you'd think at that altitude. In a market like this is, uh, is a water cooled FM transmitter, um, an attractive option because of, of air. Well, I think it's becoming uh, that. I mean, I think we all probably go back to, you know, maybe back in the day when water cooled required all kinds of external, you know, you had to have a water supply and then the, uh, what do you call those, the oh, heat exchangers yeah, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty impressive to me now, you know, like when I go to NAB or whatever and see uh, all the transmitter manufacturers or most of them, are pretty well self. Sorry, I'm talking with my hands. It's that's fine. That's down. fine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, you know that um, uh, that all their heat exchanging is done internally in the transmitter, and you don't require a lot of that external stuff outside. And boy, you can get many more kilowatts per box in a air, in a water cooled uh, situation than you can, or liquid cooled. Uh, than you can in, in error. So it'd be something that I would definitely look at in the future. Now, our, our TV brethren have been used to water-cooled transmitters mm-hmm. for a long time, but a, a, still a fair amount of complication. Uh, I Not too far from Nashville is a shortwave transmitter site, and there's water-cooled uh, mm-hmm. continental transmitters mm-hmm. there. Um, but I've uh, we're, we're going to do an upcoming torch show uh, with our friend Charles Kinney in Atlanta, Georgia, and he works for Cox in Atlanta, mm-hmm. Georgia. Uh, he just installed, I believe, a 40 kilowatt Harris water cooled mm-hmm. transmitter, or Gates Air water cooled transmitter. And uh, in, he's invited me out to that site yeah. to uh, record a show out there, record an interview. And uh, so we're going to do that and, and look at, at you know how that's so helpful to him uh, there, why it was a, a good option for him. Um, Brad, a, a few months ago, I got to go to the, uh, to the, the new uh, One World Trade Center building in New York. Yeah. And 
all the TV transmitters there are liquid cooled, mm -hmm. uh, not water, but they're, they're li liquid cooled. And the place is almost as quiet as this studio. Uh, in fact, the noisiest thing in the room was a server that was air cooled <laughs> was sitting in a rack. You know, Kirk, it's true. Uh, I just did a, an article on the uh, workbench about that. Oh, and the, uh -huh. uh, and that was the point that was made was how quiet the transmitter is. You don't even know that it's on the air. So huh. pretty amazing. Could be sounds dangerous. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, and I think too the footprint is so much smaller now that you can cram, you know, so much more into a much smaller space and yeah. get, you know, forty kilowatts and a pretty pretty amazing pretty amazing, you know, going back, you know, even twenty years ago, what you know what the equivalent space would have been. Now, just uh, I guess thinking about the physics involved, even if you did a water cooled transmitter at altitude at a ten thousand foot mountain, you still have to get rid of the heat. With the air, this right. time it's going to be outside, mm -hmm. probably, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 maybe it's easier. I mean, it's hard to add more fans to a, a transmitter of a physical size. You can only blow so much air through that. But outside with a heat exchanger, I suppose you could add another heat exchanger. You could you know divide the work up among uh, an additional heat exchanger. Hey, if, if guys at Gates Air, if I got this all wrong, I'll need to have you on the show <laughs> to explain water cooled transmitters. That might be a good time to get uh, both Charles Kinney and some people from Gates mm -hmm. Air. Uh, yeah. on, on, on the air to talk about that. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's, yeah. that's, it. but it, it, just know that just as aircraft, whether it's a helicopter or, a, or an airplane perform much more poorly uh, at, in, in terms of, you know, takeoff and landing performance uh, at 10,000 feet. Uh, so do anything blowing air, like, like transmitter fan blades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Kirk, uh, when I was selling transmitters in Europe, uh -huh. uh, we had a, a big bid for uh, the Eiffel tower. And we could not bid because the company did not have any water cooled or, or uh, uh, fluid cooled uh, transmitters. Ah. And everything at the Eiffel Tower is water cooled. They will not <laughs> have anything else there. And and part of it is what you were saying, Brad, is the compactness of everything, <laughs> keeping it all together and having uh, the higher power, but uh, in in a smaller footprint. So I want to ask Brad. Uh, don't give away any company secrets, but uh, I've noticed that uh, in. The, the 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 rack or the engineering room here mm -hmm. is spotless. Uh, you could have a meal right off the floor <laughs> there. It's absolutely gorgeous. And but I did see a lot of um, audio processing in the racks. And um, uh, talk to me about the Denver market. What's audio processing like in this market? Well, I think it's always been it's been always very competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, very loudness driven. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know how else to. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've been in this market for many years and I, to, again, to date myself can kind of remember the first AM I was at, uh, we were putting in, uh, CRL, you know, sure. which was the up and coming company that was supposed to be the loudest, proudest thing. And it was three boxes that kind of looked like they were built in Ron Jones garage and maybe they were, <laughs> but they were the loudest. You know, yeah. and um, so it, I think Denver's always been, you know, very competitive, that, very so. competitive. But now I think there's been a movement for not only being competitive, but also to keep it clean and not just a grungy, irritating sound, you know, that's that's on. And it, it's nice to be, you know, part of that, too, where you just don't crank for, um, you know, maximum uh, smoke and then uh, suffer the results, you know, later. Are there a lot of HD signals in this market? I, th I think pretty much uh, there's only one or two that come to mind that are not HD. Ah, at this okay. Point. So, so yeah, yeah. So most FMs have H HDs. Um, are, what do you find in terms of uptake uh, from consumers on HD? Because so many new cars now have HD, but mm -hmm. do consumers know about it? Do they know how to tune to them? Uh, I don't know that there's billboards around town for any HD stations. So uh, what's discovery and, and uptake like for consumers? Well, I think the discovery's, you know, been a little slow uh, on the, you know, people discovering it. But I will tell you, uh, we have a, we have a, you know, KYGO is a legacy country that's been in Denver for over 30 years uh, now. And, oh, I don't know, a few years ago, we launched a, uh, uh, a Legends channel on HD2. And I will tell you that when it's off, which isn't very often, but if we've got a T1 failure or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, we do get, we will, we start getting more and more calls uh, as, uh, you, you know, the years go on that people are listening to that 
and uh, wonder what's happened and all that. And uh, I, I think I think more and more people are finding it, and it's becoming a little less confusing. But I think there's just so much competition on that dashboard now because I know even in my vehicle, you know, and I've got a 2016 Tahoe. If I plug anything in, then boy, it just hijacks that, and you're off to uh, you know connected radio or something else, and mm. uh, so. Yeah, you got a lot of competition to fight. Yeah, I know. I know the NAB and and broadcasters are are you know, obviously trying to persuade auto manufacturers to you know, don't make me push three buttons to get to the AM radio mm-hmm. or the FM radio. Make that you know right up front, mm-hmm. and uh, that's got to be an interesting conundrum for the uh, car manufacturers um, because who knows they may be getting sweet deals with uh, the satellite providers and mm-hmm. and and others. Uh, uh, you know, and when we get as our cars are becoming more connected. Then you've got people. I don't know that they're doing this, but you know, Spotify could say, "Hey, put our button right there on the front. We'll give you a, a cut." Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah, that's yeah. pretty attractive. And broadcasters yeah. really aren't in a position mm-hmm. to to give a Ford or Chevy a, a cut. Uh-huh. So, wow. wow. Well, I think along with that, if you don't mind, might just interject yeah, just a little bit. <clears throat> you know, there. Uh, uh, I think some of the, and I've sat in on some of the white papers. One of the transmitter manufacturers that's proposing is kind of looking to the future about maybe some all digital feeds coming up in the future. I just read um, in Inside Radio the other day where one of the AMs back on the East Coast is mm-hmm. was just granted uh, authority to operate HD only. So I th- I don't think this is a technology that's going to go away. If anything, I, th- I see it expanding and I, th- you know, who knows what will happen, <clears throat> you know, in the future, whether there'll be a sunset on the analog signals or not. But I think that's fascinating. I think, you know, when you look at a, a just the spectrum of a, a, a single FM and you've got the possibilities of perhaps putting eight or more full quality, you know, uh, high quality uh, CD quality stations on there in HD, it's kind of like, wow, that's that's pretty cool. Well, this is uh, what our friends at, at Nautel have uh, demonstrated. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think they, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure I could say that. I, I realize some of the, uh, of the, the uh, bit rates are, are low, yeah. but they have demonstrated 15 radio mm-hmm. stations on a single FM transmitter, all HD. Right. Uh, and, uh, and we've, we've had, um, uh, is it Phil Schmidt mm-hmm. with, uh, with mm-hmm. Nautel? Yes. Uh, we've had him on the show to talk about this technology and, you know, where would this be useful? Well, maybe in a, in a fairly isolated village where they, they, some, a broadcaster wants to provide a variety of signals mm-hmm. off of one tower, one transmitter. And of course, everybody that wants to listen to it would have to have an HD radio that was capable of tuning all these different things uh, or de- decoding them. Right. But uh, that's just a matter of, of software. Well, I think one of the interesting things that Nautel demonstrated too was what they were, what, what, at least with the scheme they have now, you were able to, with a conventional receiver, you were able to tune, you know, most of those signals anyway. I mean, they had some, I remember one of those, uh, maybe a couple of years ago when they used an old Boston acoustics, you know, receiver, but it was capable of listening to all of those, you know, uh, you know, HD channels. So I think if the, the receiver technology is there, it's just, you know, now kind of developing and, and kind of seeing where FM goes at this point in the future. I um, want to touch on streaming also. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some large broadcasters are really big on streaming. What, what's Bonneville's position on, on streaming? You, you're in play stream. Yeah. yeah. Stream everything. And, yeah. and what do you find about, is, is there anything in, with, especially with uh, smart speakers? And I'll tell you, at the Harnack household, <laughs> my son, bless his heart, doesn't know how to tune a radio, but he can tell <laughs> she who shall not be <laughs> named. You know, we, you know, why did, <laughs> why did they call it what they did when they, when Google, I mean, when uh, Amazon could have called it the Speaker of the House. No. <laughs> oh boy, there you go. <laughs> but yeah. so, but my son can ask for anything, including my own radio stations uh, on right. the Speaker of the House. Uh, uh, is are there any interesting considerations that your programming department or your engineering department uh, makes in, in relation to maybe a, uh, a a Google Home device or an Echo Dot or Echo is going to be the main listening device? Yeah, for us, I think it's been most uh, mainly programming, you know, that's kind of had to, you know, adopt a new mindset. And, you know, I think we run on most of our stations, liners, promos occasionally that will talk about how to tell that box, you know, what to go to and, and the proper verbiage. 
uh-huh. and stuff like that. Because, you know, it, 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 I think we found that you have to be very specific, you know, mm-hmm. as, as what you ask for, yeah. you know, on that. Yeah. But, um, it's, it's, you know, it's definitely something that's, that's out there. It's well listened to. And, um, uh, so we're right on top of all of that. I, I could be wrong about this, but um, our own experimentation with my own radio stations, mm-hmm. uh, both in in the U.S. and on the mainland, Hawaii, I'm in uh, in Mississippi and in Hawaii, and in American Samoa. Um, obviously, there are there are uh, th- th- you know your call letters are exclusive. If you ask for uh, hey Echo, uh, play KHKU FM, well, you're going to get our station in Hawaii. Right. Um, if you ask for, hey, Echo, play Star 94.3, um, it appears that there is some geo information that that they uh, uh, Amazon knows where you are, where you're asking from, unless you're on a VPN, and they will find you the nearest station that goes by Star 94.3. Interesting. Yeah, because yeah. we've had, at, at that station, we have uh, partners involved in the station literally from all over the country. And some of them, if they ask for star 94.3, they get ours in Hawaii. Some of them don't. They get a different star 94.3. Now, if obviously you've asked for the call letters, you get you get the station. So we're starting to think that maybe Amazon is is geolocating uh stations to that. Maybe they're not that sophisticated. If you know, maybe you can let us know with some feedback here on on the show uh and and, and see if that seems to be true. Well, as John mentioned earlier, we were talking about call letters and stuff mm-hmm. here. We uh-huh. have a K-O-S-I here, but in this market, it's been known as cozy right. for a long time. We found early on that if you told Echo, for instance, or the other one, um, you know, play cozy, yeah. well, you could wind up with, you know, 10 different, you know, stations because yeah. there's lots of cozies around <clears throat> the country. So we've had to, you know, just have that mindset. You had to be very specific, you know, as to what you asked. Or what I usually get is. Here's a selection of cozy music yeah. from Amazon Music. Yeah. <laughs> no, not what I wanted. Yeah. There you go. That's it. No. And I should, and maybe I should point out, it may not be Amazon that's doing the geolocate. It may be TuneIn, because mm-hmm. uh, it, it, unless there's a skill that knows your station, Amazon seems to pass every request over to TuneIn, and then TuneIn determines uh, where you are because they've they've been mm-hmm. given the IP address, obviously, and and the request. So yeah, maybe it's request. actually tune in that's making that decision. Yeah. Uh, I I don't know. Okay, well, yeah. it, it's yeah. I just think that as engineers, we're uh, I'm about to write a couple of articles on uh, how to improve time spent listening on on smart speakers, and uh, what should you do for your audio, audio processing to either make the experience better on a smart speaker or at least not mess it up. Mm-hmm. You know, d- don't do something that's going to make it bad on a smart speaker. So. Uh, watch for those articles coming yeah. out in the next next few right. next few days. Or so. And you know, Kirk, that's really important too for for stations like AMs that have low power at night yeah. to be able to stream. Oh, yeah. and and yeah. people are able to pick those signals up and, and listen regardless of where they are and regardless of what the power is. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, we're gonna. I'm sorry, Brad. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say not only that, but in our case and others in this market, we've put those signals on an HD two channel. Or an HD3 channel so Uh that, you know, uh, that if you've got a a very restrictive nighttime directional, as we do, uh, it's available 24-7 on uh, a full power FM and is listenable through that whole area. Whether you have a smart speaker or not, right? Yes. Even just on your HD receiver. On the HD receiver. And we do mention that on the air. And when people call and say, oh, I can't hear you at night, you know, after sunset, it's like, no. You have an HD radio, then tune over to blah blah blah. So, yeah. or or probably the stream. Have a stream. Have a stream. By the way, we're at the facilities. If you haven't guessed, we're at the facilities of Bonneville International Radio here in Denver, and we're in the studio that's normally used for sports radio one hundred four point three, the fan, mm-hmm. right? right? So that's obviously an FM sports station. Mm-hmm. But do you have an AM sports as well? Uh, we or do. We have uh, sixteen hundred uh, KEPN, which is ah, okay. Uh, okay. ESPN, ESPN programming. Mm-hmm. Yes, all right, that's correct. But that's kind of the reference to the d- restrictive uh, nighttime directional yeah. that most of, and I'm looking off this way because Aurora is out yeah. my left here. And unfortunately there's just such a huge portion of the Metro area that, you know, 50 years ago when the station was licensed, it wasn't a big deal. It was yeah. all agricultural. Now it is a big deal, but that same signal is available on HD two on one Oh four, three, uh, one Oh four, three, 
So we've got that plus the stream. So, and we do have, we do drive listeners from that. That's really great. So, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate my very poor show prep here. Um, Brad, do you have uh, uh, one or two transmitter sites that are, let's say, challenging or fun to get to? <laughs> I think he means driving. Well, of course. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, if if you can hang on through the break, okay. we're gonna thought, we're gonna hear. Uh, uh, Brad's gonna tell us a story. I hope <laughs> <laughs> about one of his difficult transmitter sites. We're in the Mile High City, and there's, as he said, there's there's uh, transmitter sites that are more than five thousand feet higher than where we are right mm -hmm. now. Yep. So that means the car has to end up going 5,000 feet a mile, another mile up. So it, it can be quite a ways. Hey, uh, you're watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech, our weekly podcast, our weekly show about radio technology. And I want to talk to you about uh, this uh, one of our sponsors and a product from our friends at, um, uh, at, at Henry Engineering. And I think I have lost. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Here's the page. Uh, it is the Henry Engineering Sportscaster. Now, this is, you are just in time to get this uh, product, to get this little sportscaster box for your fall sports, uh, high school sports, college sports, because, you know, that football season comes up quickly uh, in August, seems to get earlier every year. And uh, those guys are out there playing. You got your sponsor sold. You want to get the game on. And you want it to sound good. I mean, don't shout into a telephone somewhere. By golly, get a, get a real sports kit. Well, the uh, sportscaster is the missing link in sports radio and video cast audio management. It's used with Henry Engineering Sports Pods to create an integrated system. Now, have you seen the Henry Engineering Sports Pods? They're cool. They sit one in front of every one of your talent, you know, the play-by-play -play person, the color person, a uh, field spotter, uh, somebody who's uh, keeping, you know, careful track of the score. You have a sports pod in front of them. They can talk. They can adjust their, uh, obviously, their headphone volume. They can listen to, um, uh, you know, chatter from a, a producer. Um, it provides isolated headphone outputs for announcers, field reporters, camera operators, if you have those, if you're videoing your games, and the producer. It mixes, now this Henry Sportscaster mixes talent mics and three other audio sources. So if you've got, uh, of all things, a cassette deck, or maybe you've got a digital recorder that you've been using uh, to get, uh, you know, coaches comments, uh, before the game, maybe at halftime. And then even after the game, you know, send that field spotter down to the locker room, get the coaches comments and, uh, and, and bring them back. Um, then you can put those right on the air. The Henry sportscaster, uh, includes comprehensive intercom and talk back systems for everybody that's involved. And it's ideal for school sports video webcasts. So if you're going to do that, Hey, back in the day when I was uh, in, I was the, lo the local AV lackey. I had a black and white camera and an open reel videotape machine, and I would uh, I would video the the football games actually and, and the basketball games. But you know what? When I started, I had a black and white film movie camera that we used with little 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 film reels that we did. Oh, my gosh. oh yeah, it was one year of that. We had, that was about <laughs> enough of that. Well, uh, Henry Engineering introduces the Sportscaster. Uh, check it out at Henry Engineering, uh, Henry Eng, that's Henry E-N-G, Henry E-N-G dot com is the website. Um, you need to check this thing out, the Henry Sportscaster. Pretty amazing gear. And, you know, if you really want to find out about it, the place to go is Broadcaster's General Store. Because Broadcaster General Store uh, brings you this announcement about Henry and the Sportscaster. And their website is even easier than henryeng.com. It's BGS, as in Broadcasters General Store, bgs.cc. bgs.cc. Five little letters and a period will get you there. And uh, I tell you what, I really enjoy doing business ordering from Broadcasters General Store. Uh, the, the Shoot family and the Kirsten family, just amazing, wonderful people. And not only are they good folks who take care of things, but they have actually been working for something like 20 plus years to finely tune their internal computer systems and ordering systems. They can tell you what's available, when it's going to be available, how soon it'll ship to you, and their prices, I don't tell you what, you, just, you can't beat them. You can't beat them. <laughs> it's, no. it's amazing. I mean, I, I've called them and said, well, I can get this for so-and-so from eBay. They said, oh, we can beat that. No problem. <laughs> so yeah. if, you need, if you need audio gear, microphones, uh, audio processing, anything you need, Call these folks at Broadcaster General Store or visit their website at bgs.cc and check out the Henry uh, Sportscaster. That is a cool, cool box. All right. Are we hmm. done with that? I think we're done with that. Yeah, the Henry Sportscaster. Okay. So we're back this week in Radio Tech, episode 404 uh, with John Bissett, Brad Hart. I'm going to hang uh, old Brad on, if you will, for a couple more minutes, and then we're going to get to uh, John Bissett and some uh, some workbench uh, items. Uh, Brad, I want to hear a story or something about these hmm. 
transmitter sites that are just way up there in the mountains and the, you've got snow and ice and abominable snowmen and all kinds of danger. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about an exciting place. Well, I, yeah, I have to, I have to be very honest with you. There are so many of those that go back, you know, so many years that um, I, I'll just say this, that, that part of our kit, we have two engineering vehicles that, that both Gary and I carry as standard equipment with us uh, probably from October on our snowshoes, uh, winter boots, uh, parka, uh, you know, all of that, because there are just a lot of places. I mean, frankly, you know, the, the snow removal around here in the city is great as you get into the mountains, CDOT, all those folks do a great job, but frankly, you're getting into remote places that, that, uh, you know, you've got to wait a couple of days for them to plow out. And, uh, I, in 2003, we ended up with, uh, at the site that's at 10,600 feet, Denver got a blizzard and ended up with probably a little over 36 inches of snow. But up there, we had 10 feet. Of uh, snow? Yes. Ooh. It was uh, it was up to oh, the, it, you, you uh, and the caretaker's house, his deck is 10 feet above the snow. So he literally would just walk out. Because we had a couple of breakers that were tripping, and our transmitter building is the one next door. We couldn't get to the site. I mean, you couldn't get anywhere close to it, snowshoes or anything else. But I remember the the uh, caretaker at the time would just literally walk out on his deck, walk out on the snow, and then he had to tunnel in down <laughs> to the door because the tra- the, the snow was taller than the door. So he had to tunnel in. Yeah. And they get the key and go in, you know, reset breakers or whatever, you know, needed to be done. So it gets, those are the hundred year snowstorms, but that's the one, those are ones that, you know, uh, easily remind you of, you know, the conditions here. So we just carry that. We've had to walk into several of our sites over the years. Uh, thankfully, that, that amount of snow, because you just can't get there. And of course, you're kind of like the utility linemen things don't go south until you know you got really bad weather and, weather you know. and all of that and uh, then all of a sudden your evening's kind of interrupted with eh, you know got breakers tripped or you know whatever and you got to get up there tell me about uh how reliable is commercial power and is it overhead or underground and then uh, what do you have for for generators in that all of our sites uh have generators uh, typically 150 kilowatt uh generators that will keep Transmitters of full power, air conditioning, um, you know, uh, all of that. So all of our sites um, have that. And I, I have to say, um, even the sites, even our mountain sites, they do an excellent job of uh, tree removal along the right of ways because that's the biggest issue. Really? In the in the springtime, we get the spring and fall are the worst times because you get these really heavy spring snow storms that weigh down the branches of the big pine trees or whatever, and then fall over into the power lines or they weigh the power lines down. So all in all, it's uh, power reliability has been great. Uh, utilities up there or above ground, there's, you know, so you got to clear the trees every few years, you know, up there. And some of these three phase feeds are coming from many, many miles, you know, away. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, there's lots of things that can go wrong. Are, in, are any of these sites fed from two directions? I guess they're not they're not big enough to support no, that kind of thing. No, right? unfortunately not. If uh, you lose that, you're just you're over on generator. And typically we keep um, we share one site with a public service a public safety agency. Mm-hmm. So we keep three days of fuel at most of our sites so that we at least we've got a fighting chance to get up there with a fuel truck or something if we needed to add fuel. Yeah. I would, I would think, well, I would think three days could go by pretty quickly if you get 10 feet of snow. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. Brad, what do you do to keep the uh, the fuel uh, from going stale? Well, we, we have a check annually, first of all, and then okay. uh, they recommend uh, some fuel additives. Okay. But to be honest with you, um, you know, we, uh, I'm not going to say we'll burn through it, but we, we test those generators weekly, sometimes with, without loads. So, we don't keep fuel in there. It, it's not like we have thousands of gallons. We have okay. hundreds of gallons versus thousands. So it's a little easier to keep that from going stale, you know, with some additives and keep the water out of it. So, so and, far. And, when, and when you test them, how long do you test them? 
a year once a week test. Is it yeah. like for a half hour, for an hour? Hour. An hour? Mm-hmm. Okay. We'll go for an hour. Mm-hmm. Yep. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, we take, uh, keeping our stations on the air, take that very seriously. And whether it's, you know, with, you know, generators or uh, air chains or whatever, we have redundant systems throughout. And we're fortunate to have that. You mentioned earlier uh, T1 lines. And I guess some of your STLs are, are T1. Mm-hmm. Are they all? Or do you have any microwave 450 oh. or what do you do? Yeah, well, uh, funny you ask. We've we've got uh, T1s. We have conventional 950 microwave. And then we also have uh, 5.8 uh, uh, gigahertz okay. uh, licensed, licensed link uh, because we have one site that, that frankly never had it has commercial power, but the, uh, the the telcos never felt there was any reason to put that up there. So we provide everything up there from phone lines to internet to all of our connectivity goes on this uh, 6.8 or 5.8 uh, radio system. Wow. Wow. That's a, that, so, it, it, it's a different world than uh, in Nashville, Tennessee or mid- Greenville, Mississippi or yeah. up where and, you live. And, and, you know, Kirk, I was just thinking for the new engineer who may be taking over a station, just knowing, okay, there's a generator there. Do I need to test it? Yes, you do. Uh, This weekly test that Brad talks about is really important because these are your backups. When they're not there to back you up, then you're really in hot water. So uh, don't neglect the maintenance. Don't neglect uh, the the weekly test. And uh, do you have a a means of knowing that the generator test has taken place and is... uh, uh, has been satisfactory. Yeah, absolutely. We bring Good. back uh, status, you know, Excellent. from those generators that not only tell us when it's running. Uh, so at 9 a.m. every Monday, we better get, you know, a status back from the site that says, you know, the generator is exercising. And then also when the generator is running on emergency and it's online and then when it's off. So we kind of can gauge how much fuel, you know, we've burned and all that. So very important to monitor that. But as you were talking, not only maintenance, but rodent infestation. Mm, uh, and we had a situation uh, not too long ago where a pack rat decided to move in. I don't know yeah, how prevalent. It wasn't me. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well this guy was. <laughs> a little smaller, huh? <laughs> well, a little smaller, but boy, what a what a mess. Uh, you know, he made with or she, whatever, but dragged all of this stuff bits of metal and uh, 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 hardware and nuts and bolts and screws and just all kinds of junk, the thing in, the, in these nests. Because this, I don't, I don't know how prevalent pack rats are throughout the country, but this thing made a nest that was, you know, hey, was big. that big, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, probably a good foot in diameter. And um, it was a big headache, you know, to get in and, you know, get that cleaned out because generator people won't clean that out. When they come and see that, it's like, nah, we're not going to touch that. You need to clean it out. Once we got it cleaned out, I went down to Home Depot and got uh, just like commercial weather stripping uh, because we've put these in in enclosed enclosures up there. So people, you know, f- to minimize vandalism, but there were gaps at the bottom that were probably two inches. So put that stuff up there so they couldn't crawl in. We put copper. Um, Oh, what do you call it? Uh, kind of like uh, um, steel wool, even made of copper, yeah. it, copper, made of wool, copper yeah. so it wouldn't, uh, so it doesn't rust, yeah. you know, out in the elements. Yeah. And you know what? After probably close to three years, we've been successful in keeping the little booger out, and and all that. But they can do massive amounts of damage, uh, very mm. expensive. And then you, you go to the generator, you got nothing. And I, I guess the attractiveness of the generator is probably some warmth, warmth. Yeah, because warmth. it's got a, a heater oh, yeah. in there. Yeah, there's a block heater that you know runs year round, yeah. and the temperature gets down, whatever it is for the engine, the, that thing warms up, and it's like, yeah, boy, hey, I, this I is like home. This. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder at, now, see, in, instead of being so mean to this rat, you could build it a little house, <laughs> well, put put a little put a, a little light bulb, a little light bulb in, there. in there to keep it warm. <laughs> yeah, give it a keep supply it of junk from your junk drawer. You know. <laughs> I'll put that in the suggestion box. <laughs> there, there, there you go. Have you ever tried using mothballs? Yeah, we have. And I've, in fact, Gary was reading uh, one of your uh, more recent, you know, uh, uh, workbench oh, you know, okay. things about that. And he did. Uh, so we have we have that uh, in there. But we've really, truly found that the best way is just to block 
you know, because it's surprising how small of a hole a mouse can get through. And uh, so we've 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 used a combination of hardware and uh, mothballs to try to keep them That's out. That's good. Well, yeah. it's kind of funny. Today, earlier, we did a presentation for a group of engineers, and uh, Kirk mentioned the mothball uh, uh, means of, of repelling uh, uh, mice and rodents mm-hmm. and things. And then added, someone made a comment, well, I don't like the smell of the mothballs. Yeah. And Kirk said, well, I like the smell of, what was it? Uh, jet fuel. Jet fuel. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, I guess it depends on what you like. If you want the roaches or, or the uh, the mice and snakes in there, yeah. or you uh-huh. put up with a mothball smell. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, they can cause some serious damage. Some, some serious damage. It cost you a ton of money. So uh, you haven't always had microwave links going there. I mean, 5.8 gig, right? I'm you, sorry, it's 6. We, six, eight, we yeah. had unlicensed five eight, and then yeah. finally had to go to license six dot eight. Yeah. So, um, uh, th- that but that's an IP link, yeah. So you can bring data up and down, VoIP phones, that kind of thing. Well, if you want. Uh, yeah, actually, we run uh, uh, the, the way these radios are set up are uh, E ones. Okay, so gotcha. we've got gotcha. we've got that connectivity four channels uh, over the E ones. Yeah, you know, going up there. So we provide our own phone service, LAN okay. data. Uh, uh, we have interplex shelves up there that uh, running off the E1, so we, you know, all program audio, and then that's backed up by a 950 uh, STL. Do any of your sites have uh, have weather cams or security cams that you can remote into? We're getting more, uh, more and more into the security just because of all the break-ins and uh, uh-huh. and all that and the copper thefts. So, yeah, I can't say all of them have them, but we're heading that direction most assuredly. I've been uh, I've been doing some of that at uh, uh, at a couple of transmitter sites and just really seen some value there. If I mean, sure, it's there's a, there's a curiosity that I mean, it's kind of fun to go look in on a on a place, mm-hmm. especially a place you're familiar with, um, uh, and, and have some inside the the building. Look at the transmitters. Not that you can exactly read the meters, although I did see. Oh, I saw at an SBE meeting recently of uh, somebody. Uh, wanted to, oh, I know what it was. It was they had a, a pressure gauge on the nitrogen, and they for some reason did, did not buy that gauge by what the company Fartronics. Fartronics remember that? Yes, yeah. uh-huh. they didn't buy that. Uh, they put a video camera right up close, to, <laughs> and then they had a light on it, you know, from a, a little utility light, uh, so they could they remotely could read, they could the, actually the read, read, the, read the pressure gauge <laughs> remotely. Great. No yeah. calibration required, yeah. right? That's right, that's right. No calibration required. Maybe they were looking at both the supply and the uh. And the you know the line pressure, the mm-hmm. supply pressure, and the line pressure. So they yeah. can see both at the same time. But that was a pretty unique use for for a camera. Yeah, yeah. we haven't gone to the camera for dehydrator, but uh, some of the newer Andrew, you know, uh, dehydrators actually have. Uh, and I'm not sure if they're standard or those are optional, but they do uh, have uh, uh, contact closures coming out. That if ah. the if the pressure drops below three pounds, we usually keep five 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 and a half. It'll give you a closure on the remote, and again, you know, pretty important to you know keep those lines charged. So, uh, my station in, in Mississippi, when we every few years we'll get some ice, and of course that wreaks havoc because mm-hmm. we don't have heated elements, and and we typically don't have radomes in Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Uh, you must deal with that every every winter, right? Uh, ice and snow buildup. Um, we have ice at the one that's the site that we have a site that's about uh, sixty eight hundred. Feet, that that is the one that's subject because it's kind of between it's kind of in that layer where it gets really moist and it gets uh, cold. Yeah, the site at ten six dry right? is dry, yeah. and we've never we have radomes on there, but rarely have any any type of buildup on that just because of the elevation. But the the medium elevation one really gets iced up, but that one's got heaters on it, and most of the time it keeps you know that up. But uh, you know there there are times it gets built up, but you know, thankfully, uh, you know, today's transmitters are smart enough to sense that, cut throttle back power a little bit uh, so they don't burn up any, uh, uh, you know, output stages. And But uh, you got to have some. Do you have any uh, sites where you, you have a master antenna and you're you're diplexing several stations together? Well, we're, we're moving to that ah, right now okay. as, as we speak. It's a... Uh, we will be the fourth station on uh, on this on this master antenna. Wow. So, yep. So that, that's kind of it, that. That may not be a new thing in your overall experience, but that's that's is that new for Bonneville here in Denver? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. We were all on, uh, um, you know, we don't want to call them standalone uh, sites. Mm. Uh, uh, 
Uh, you know, we had one shared, but you know, right now the biggest combined we have is two stations. We never had four. This one's certainly capable of going and having more stations on it. But for us here, uh, it's 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 a much different you know thing and having a a a huge room full of combiners and and all of that. Now, Brad, will you be keeping your auxiliary site then <clears throat> for those stations? Um, as backup yeah we okay keep, yeah we we maintain uh backup on on uh, uh on all the fms uh at this point so yeah we'll keep those good because you never know well that's it <laughs> uh, again thinking for the the new engineer when you replace a piece of equipment if the piece of equipment that you're replacing can be used as a standby you know you're giving yourself a, a little bit of insurance that if the main piece of equipment goes down you've got something to fall back on so and uh, that's why i still have a gates level devil at the station. <laughs> and it works <laughs> i know it doesn't work uh, i'll sorry. buy it from you or some tube type cart <laughs> machine tell us you go. got a stay level, too, <laughs> stay level yeah. too. that's right <laughs> so I, you know there's there's a brand i'm so glad you, and yeah, thanks for, for sticking with us a bit longer because i keep thinking of questions so the, to me geographically the denver market's pretty interesting because you've got this this area here where denver is that's reasonably flat right here and then you've got these mountains just a few miles you know to the west really high so you put a, a tower there on the on the mountain ridges that are over, overlooking denver right mm -hmm. and and denver and boulder and this sure. whole area mm -hmm. you cover that great what is there to cover on the backside? Uh, is there population there at all? Are you worried about that at all? Uh, to be honest, no, yeah. no. I mean, there's a lot of ski traffic and stuff right. you know, that goes up there. That's pretty seasonal and uh, stuff like that. I can tell you the master antenna we're on now, uh, boy, it's it is really pulled in. You know that that lobe is strictly out over the Denver metro okay. area, and yeah. it is just pulled in tight as a drum. You know to the west because. You, there's two couple of things that happen. You get all that signal going back there. You get a lot of multipath because you got a lot of stuff higher back behind you that has a lot of reflections. Oh, so that's not okay. really what you're after either. But that doesn't so, help in the Denver. We yeah. have reflections no, you coming. Get those don't reflections that. coming back yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So most most everybody is pretty well, you know, kept that you know signal, you know, coming uh, coming east, and that's that's pretty much it. What about AM stations in, in the Denver market? Uh, you know, the, the, the bigger stations, where do they tend to put their towers? Right here in town or out a bit? Where? Yeah, of course, a lot of those are really a stab that have been around for a long time yeah. for, because it's, you know, it's kind of that, you know, that movement that's been around for probably the last 20, 30 years, not in my backyard. I was going to say, now, now there are a lot of communities oh, that yeah. are built around oh, those sure. sites. Right? Okay. So you look at, you know, the iHeart. You know, the KOAs, the, the, the big blow torches that have been around. Well, you know, I worked there back longer than I care to admit for a while. But when I was out there, it was farmland. And now there's like a Home Depot. <laughs> you can throw, you know, and you're yeah. kind of thinking, well, how can you get a, you know, you must have RF, you know, just light the, you know, fluorescent fixtures. But so many of those areas, uh, even REM back then was, was, uh, uh, there were, it was so remote uh, back there that the, there was no housing areas, but everything is just built up crazy mm -hmm. now around everybody. And there's very little place to go unless you're going to pull that, pull up stakes and move that thing far out, uh, far out of Denver. Wow. I can't think of an AM move around here for a long time. It's mm -hmm. been a long time. That's, that's similar to, um, I was at WSB in Atlanta on uh what was it tuesday i was there yeah yes tuesday yes. and we had a we had a cook out there for some of the engineers yeah. in, in the area and their tower used to be out in farmland way outside of atlanta and uh uh now it, it's a shopping center right i mean right around the tower yeah. and of course Amazing. of course there's there over the years have been plenty of rf problems and the engineers at wsb i mean we apparently when you sign a lease at this shopping center you acknowledge that there is a lot of rf here and your your phones or whatever your pa speakers <laughs> wow. and if you just do what we say it'll be okay but yeah very good yeah. Oh, that's yeah. neat. 
Wow. So, uh, hey, we're going to take a break and be and be right back with a final word uh, from John Bissett. And he hasn't gotten a word in edgewise. Oh, oh, no, we have. We've talked, we've talked about uh, rodents and, uh, and keeping uh, uh, and mothballs, the yeah. smell of mothballs. Yeah. So, no, we've done some fine things. Uh, when we do get back, I'd uh-huh. like to talk about uh, Brad's start in broadcasting. Oh, yeah, let's do that. Okay. So this is, this is fascinating. Stick around. We're going to hear from our friends at Lavo, and we'll be right back. Hang on. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at. But have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now, we all know that there are some console features that Jock only uses once in a while. So why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once-in-a-blue-moon controls to a touch-sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context-sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments. Dual-mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes. And enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo radio tech at www.lawo.com slash twert. And thanks a lot to our friends at Lavo for sponsoring this week in radio tech. Sure appreciate their, their help. And so um, we're here with uh, John Bissett, my colleague from Telos, and also he's the uh, the author of the um, workbench. The workbench column. Wow. Yes. Oh, yeah. The radio so world. we've got a great tip from John coming up, and we're spending a, a few more minutes with Brad Hart, the director of engineering for Bonneville International here in Denver, Colorado, with a beautiful facility here. It's really great. Although I understand you're going to be uh, putting in some new gear in the next uh, year or so. We're, we're headed that direction. So we we uh, we wanted to know how Brad got started because yeah, well, it's fascinating. Well, from the uh, the workbench yeah. column, I, I go back for those of you that haven't seen it. Uh, they were doing some uh, uh, telephone line work, uh, and the old telephone splicing tents were up in the uh, in the air. And it reminded me of when I was a kid. That was one of the things that sparked me into mm-hmm. you know you see the guy crawling up the tower with the spikes on, or up the the phone yeah. pole with the spikes yeah. on his uh, on his feet. And then he disappeared into this tent for the rest of the day. And uh, it's like, man, what's going on in there? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You thought, I can go camping and do electronics (laughs) at the same time. Absolutely, that's right. And climb poles. So we've gotten, uh, after mentioning that, I I just mentioned, you know, that was one of the things that kind of moved me into wanting to be in broadcasting. And I've asked readers, what did you, what do you think? So I asked Brad, I want him to share his story because it's pretty cool. Well, and and when you asked me earlier about an hour ago, it kind of got the old wheels turning because they don't turn quite as fast as they did. <laughs> but um, I got to thinking that you know one of the, the the very first thing was that my mom had had got me a walkie-talkie. It was a three transistor super hip uh, receiver, and for those who may not know what a super heterodyne receiver, it covered pretty much the entire CB band. And so any signal that was there, <laughs> you, hear. you heard. And it transmitted on one channel, but received everything. So I was pretty fascinated, you know, about that. But then she took that one step further, I think, and saw that fascination and got me an older Heath kit. And again, if you don't know Heath kit, look it up. But it was a, uh, I, I, she got me a, uh, it was a GR91 four tube, tube, vacuum tube, <laughs> not transistor, four vacuum tube receiver that was a short wave. And I got to tell you, I, I just I, I was fascinated by the fact that I could be an armchair traveler and sit and visit places every night, 
during the day that I probably never visit. I've never visited before. That was during the Cold War. So um, um, I could listen, you know, behind the Iron Curtain to Radio Free Europe. A lot of those places that, you know, radio was kind of verboten and, and very, uh, a lot of times jammed. And <clears throat> that kind of took me on into amateur radio, which I still am a, uh, after many years absence, was relicensed in an amateur extra class now uh, and have been for about the last 10 years. But that just was fascinating to me that, you know, that how radio worked. And so I started, I built my own part 15, by the way, um, AM and FM, you know, I had one on 670 kilohertz AM and whatever frequency was available, you know, back then for FM. And just, I just loved the whole concept uh, of that. And I got, you know, when I got my first job in radio, I, I thought I had the world by the tail. Isn't it neat? Yeah. That is so cool. So, so that was it. That's but really was, neat. And well, I still enjoy my, that. My radio or my transmitter was a Lafayette, but I figured out, okay, it yep. goes down the end of the block with a six-foot wire. Yep. If I put a hundred-foot wire <laughs> yep. and string it over to the garage, yep. it'll cover seven two feet. or three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's really neat. Kirk, how yeah. about you? I, I, I didn't really have an interest in, in broadcasting, uh, in pirate broadcasting or, or part, or part, <laughs> or part 15 <laughs> at, at, at that. Age, and, and the, the really short story is, and someday we'll, we'll, we'll go over it if, if anybody's <laughs> interested, but the really short story is I wanted to, to, I had an interest in electronics. I like making lights flash and motors move yeah. and, and even more. And I, and I built some Heath kits. I built a shortwave receiver. It was a solid state one, but this would have been in about 19, 19- 73. Right. Uh, I built a Heath kit and uh, uh, like a four band shortwave. Mm-hmm. Um, and I built a Heath kit calculator, a four banger, you know, plus minus divide and oh, yeah. uh, multiply. Uh, it, yeah. And, um, and a couple other Heath kits. I never built a television. I, I guess mm-hmm. dad didn't trust me enough to yeah. buy a television that I was going to build. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and I, and I, you know, I ordered electronic parts and made little, just little things. Well, but I really wanted to be on the radio. You know, I, I wanted to be behind mm-hmm. a microphone, but here's the weird thing. I wanted to be on the radio because I couldn't. And I couldn't because when I was in up to about my mid teens, I had a speech impediment. I stuttered profoundly. I mean, I couldn't oh. say my name. And uh, and I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how I overcame that or if it was me that did it or just growing out of it or whatever. There's, I know there's a lot of people who are, I think they call it now disfluency. They don't call it stuttering so much. But because uh, so I wanted to do what I couldn't do. And so, and somehow I got involved with, um, university productions, uh, of, of television at Eastern Kentucky university where my dad taught. And then I got hooked. I got horn swoggled into running the board on the radio station while the jazz DJ that night went and saw his girlfriend at the girl's dorm. So that's how I got into I was horn swoggled. There you go. Oh, that's great. That's great. But yeah, I had an interest in, in the electronics and, and what was interesting to me is that um, the other board operators wanted to show me like, how do I get the game? You know, we were the flagship station for a, a EKU football team. How do you get the game on there? Well, you push this patch in, you throw that switch, you throw that switch and the game will be there. Well, that wasn't good enough for me. I went, well, why will it be there? What does that do? And nobody knew I had to go get the engineer out of the TV department and say, they told me I had to do this, 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 and this, and what's happening. And so the engineer could tell, well, this kid's interested. I'll tell, you know, well, this connects from this and this wires over to here. And, and so I began to understand why things did the way they did. And that to me was fascinating. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. That's really neat. Well, you know, one other thing too, back then, and I think probably John can address this too, is that when I got into broadcasting and even just playing around pirate or not, <laughs> but you had to build a lot of your own stuff because yeah. you couldn't find a lot of this stuff. That was off the shelf. Thankfully, you got the folks, you know, that, that you were just mentioning, Henry Engineering, who's made all kinds of wonderful widgets and things that you wish you'd had, and Radio Design Labs that has done that too. But yeah. but you had to build. If you needed a this or a that, or if you needed impedance matching or however you needed to do that, you typically had to deal with that, you know, yourself, which, you know, I think today – you're, you're lost a lot from that because you don't have the time and you don't have the resources. There's so many things going on. You don't have the time to sit down on a workbench and spend, you know, two or three days building a this or that. And, um, so I'm, I'm, you know, to be honest, 
you know, my interest in electronics and all that, uh, I don't regret a minute of that because you can, you know, if you can't find it, you can probably build it. And you can, and nowadays you can Google a circuit if you're not quite sure what to do. Although I must say, I'm disappointed in my own self for this reason. Uh, if I had to solve a little logic problem, okay, if this comes on, that comes on, this comes on, I want to do this. Yeah. Uh, of course, a lot of kids, they would solve that with an Arduino. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. uh, now, what I should do is solve that with some logic gates, you know, TTL, right. logic, some CMOS, CMOS logic gates. Yep. That's what I should do based on my coming up through the world of electronics. But honestly, I, maybe I didn't learn that stuff well enough and it's kind of left me. I, I'd go get some relays. You know, and that's that's <laughs> you know, that's a plan C, yeah. which unfortunately is often my plan A. Well, my plan A is to figure out how do I do it with uh, with audio over IP and control and Ethernet, you know, because sure. now so many of the, the things that we used to build little boxes for, as we used to call them bud boxes. Yeah. Uh, now, so many of those functions, if you just build out the audio, the the uh, networking infrastructure that. Uh, different companies have certainly one of our sponsors here, yeah. uh, Telos. You can get done, you know, most of what you need to get done with that. Um, so uh, yeah, you still need a Henry Engineering uh, super relay box to yeah, sure. to to light the light. Uh, but now maybe you're lighting a string of LEDs and your current is only 200 milliamps instead of yeah. you know uh, at, at at 12 or five volts instead Oops. of you know lighting 200 some watts. 200 watts. <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a different world we're we're, we're getting into. Yeah. Still important to know the fundamentals or yeah. know where to find them. Yeah. No, but that's, that's why good. John's column is good, you know, too, because we read that every time it comes out because it's just, it's a very valuable. And I don't care whether you've been in the business like I have for decades or you're just starting out. There's just a lot of good, you know, got a lot, a lot of good common sense. And I found over the years that common sense gets you a lot of, you know, a lot of places mm-hmm. here. And, and so we always appreciate, you know, every, oh, everything you're very that welcome. You, Thank you. And, uh, uh, look forward for some uh, suggestions. Well. From you. So <laughs> that'll be good. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, and that's one of the things we were talking today about uh, tips that uh, that people have. I think probably one of the most popular was labeling circuit breakers. Uh, we talked about the safety aspect of that, that uh, even inside your circuit breaker box where the panel box where you've got, you know, 20 breakers individually labeling each one of those so that if there's an emergency, you don't have to look at that hand scribbled legend that's Grid, inside, yeah, that's inside, inside yeah, the yeah. Uh, box that you can't read anymore, but you know exactly where the breaker is. You can find it very quickly. So uh, there's a, uh, a plug for the uh, brother P touch. Ah, yeah, yeah, those yeah. things are really, <clears throat> really invaluable. So yeah. anyway, but thank you very much. I, uh, I enjoy doing the column, and for those of you that aren't aware of it, it's RadioWorld.com, and then ju- just search for Workbench. It's the Workbench column. And Yep, great column. You've asked good. Are you in there every other issue? No, every issue. Every so issue. Twi- twice a month. I'm yeah, sorry, I only read every other one, so <laughs> <laughs> I've missed half of them, actually. That's, a, that's why he's getting so many good tips. <laughs> We got to have you back on again. We have, we tend fun. to have you on every couple of years yeah, or so. We got to exactly. make it you know, a little we'll more often. That. That would be fun. All right. Very good. And Brad, since I haven't seen you, what, in, in 15 years, well, we got to get together more we often. Do. We do. But it's been great having you both here and, uh, you know, having a chance to catch up and, and chit chat and all that. So it's been great. It's been great. Thank for you us for your hospitality. Thank you. This has thank been you. great. Very good. Uh, I want to thank uh, our sponsors, the folks at Lavo, the folks at uh, Henry Engineering through Broadcasters General Store, and my friends at the Telos Alliance, makers of the VX uh, multi-studio, multi-line phone system and the VX Prime. Appreciate all of their help. Also, I appreciate very much our producer, Suncast. He's always right on. I guess switching today's show is a little bit easy. <laughs> we had one camera, but thanks very much, Suncast. I really appreciate you being there. Great job. And also thanks to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. Uh, where lots of other fine podcasts are found as well. Tell your friends, please, about uh, This Week in Radio Tech. You know, we have a, uh, a a YouTube page. Just look for This Week in Radio Tech on YouTube. And if you, su- you subscribe, then you'll get automatically notified uh, on your on your cell phone, on your on your device, whatever it is. You'll be notified that, hey, there's a new episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, and so that's a great way to, to keep up with it. And a place where all your usual podcasts uh, are found, uh, you can find us there as well. So thanks again, again for uh, being with us. We're live in Denver. I'm headed home. Uh, John, you're here tomorrow. We got a, you, you've got a, a picnic tomorrow. SBE, SBE uh, picnic. Yeah. You're coming to that as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. We'll Look out, Mom, time. after 48. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Yep. Well, that'll be fun. We'll yeah. take pictures of the food for me. We'll Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Will do. And uh, and and is, is, and is there an, oh, then, and, uh, the local guys here uh, we saw today, they made a trip to the National 
the uh, NIST? Uh, right. Uh, the uh, timing folks, right? Uh, they, they saw the cesium clock. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that sits there at almost zero degrees Kelvin. You know, you're going to have to come back here and do a couple of more shows because yeah. there's a lot of technology here that you never thought about in Denver. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm amazed. Uh, mm -hmm. There's WWV up in Boulder, right? Right, and then uh, any NAST, and uh, you know, so uh, a lot of things to keep you busy. I, I heard WWV is going to start putting, going to do the uh, PPM thing on. So they. <laughs> <laughs> Why are they, all, hey, all they need a Voltaire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All time, all the time. All right, folks, we got to go. You take care and catch us next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye. So long.